Sam said that you were the man for the job. And I can't find a flaw in that statement. Stop me if you've heard this one before. A cop who breaks all the rules, gets chewed out by his superiors, goes by his gut instinct, his girlfriend can't get through to him, and he's also always right. So this is one of those. But here the cop has a name cooler than anybody not named Jake McFunk. Do you let anything reach you? I mean really reach you. This movie also has a pretty famous car chase. Bullet. Now listen to me, Lieutenant. Bullet was a 1968 movie starring Steve McQueen as Lieutenant Frank Bullet, a San Francisco-based detective assigned to protect a witness. Frank Bullet, I shit you not, that's his name. I mean, a cop named Bullet. That's like having a dentist named Drill or a sanitation worker named Dump. What? If you've never seen Bullet, the plot and characters will probably still sound familiar since decades of film and television about maverick cops have been influenced by this film and there's nothing those pencil pushers at City Hall can do about it. Frank Bullet is summoned by the ambitious Senator Walter Chalmers, who has a job for Bullet. As you know, there's a Senate subcommittee hearing here Monday. And I have a star witness who needs protection. The witness, Ross, may have stolen from his mob bosses. Oh, the irony. As it turns out, they're disappointed that someone would be so dishonorable as to steal. I mean, it's just not right. Have him in court on Monday, Frank. Ross and his police minder are both injured when two thugs break in, popping off shotguns at close range. Who is it? Ross. Two guys. They got him with a shotgun. Ross does die in hospital later that night, but Frank Bullet wants to keep the investigation going without Chalmers getting involved, so he conspires to temporarily conceal Ross's death and steal the corpse to carry out an autopsy in another facility because... I want this kept open. If Chalmers finds out that Ross died, he's going to fold this up, and I want the man that killed him. Well, when you have a name like Frank Bullet, you don't need to justify anything to those starched collars at the mayor's office. Someone's out to get Bullet, and that's when the film's main reason for watching happens, a lengthy car chase through San Francisco. Bullet's Ford Mustang faces off against two thugs in their Dodge Charger, a face-off that has been replicated many times, whether it's for Metallica music video I Disappear, or it's just two dentists attending a conference racing each other with the modern versions of these cars in their base spec rented from Hertz. The thugs are killed when their car crashes and burned up. And pretty soon, Frank is also grilled, though this time thankfully less literally. Meanwhile, Frank's love affair with Kathy is hitting a wall. In that, Frank is a wall. Kathy has her own career, but Frank is such a wall that nothing seems to get through to him. As Frank is now without transport, Kathy drives him to investigate his last remaining lead, which turns out to be a dead woman, where Kathy unfortunately stumbles into the crime scene. You're living in a sewer, Frank. Day after day. After a tense scene of everybody standing around waiting to receive a fax so the plot can make sense all of a sudden, the guy they thought was Ross it turns out to be a used car salesman from Chicago, hired by Ross to stand in for him, and the dead woman was the doppelganger's wife. The real Ross hired the thugs to kill whoever so that his former associates would think he's dead and he's now about to fly off to Europe. The end of the film is Bullet and his partner Del Getty chasing down Ross, grounding his plane before a shootout, where naturally Bullet will prevail. He's still copping some heat, but he's such a cool guy that he ends the film by washing his hands. We could be profound and say he's washing the stink of his job off his hands. However, cards on the table, the very first time I saw this film, I mistook the sound of the running water filling the sink for Frank taking a piss. I'll try to back you up. Bullet. It's alright. It was a very big hit at the time of its release, both critically and financially. But it's solid. I totally get why it was a big deal in its day. But for me, maybe it's more interesting personally in terms of just how much of a blueprint it would turn out to be for cop movies and television shows for decades. And there was nothing that those clowns down at the studio could do about it. Are you going to tell me or not? Well, I can at the present time. The late 1960s was a weird time in Hollywood movies. Movies were generally not doing well theatrically, with audiences on the whole preferring to stay at home and watch television. The studios were being sold off cheaply by their founders to random companies who were often more interested in the real estate opportunities afforded by redeveloping studio complexes and backlots. The contract system tying actors to studios had broken down, and there was also the end of the Hayes Code in 1968, which had governed what you could and couldn't depict on screen. What was cutting through 
edgy affair with more overt sex and violence, exemplified by the likes of Bonnie and Clyde and Point Blank released the previous year. And there was nothing that those stuffed shirts at the MPAA could do about it. Bullet is probably best labelled as a thriller. It's got some intense action sequences punctuated by a lot of tenser scenes. In a film like Christmas Lunch at Uncle Reg's house, treats conversation as something to be avoided at all costs. Bullet is a solid movie that's held up okay, but it's really made by a few standout scenes. Look, Chalmers, let's understand each other. I don't like you. And while it's one of McQueen's signature roles, he's also had better characters to play. Steve McQueen says very little. He's dead. And often he's just standing there, clearly deep in contemplative thought. He's not a wise cracking tough guy since he says very little unrelated to the plot. Maybe Bullet's mother, Mrs. Bullet, had taught him that if you haven't got anything nice to say, then say nothing. But by the same token, as his mother may have said, Frankie really should watch out because the wind might change direction and he'll be stuck with an unimpressed expression. People talk at him and he barely reacts. This is a common observation of Minnie McQueen's roles in the 60s and early 70s. I compare his performance in Bullet to a film I remember seeing in high school, where McQueen starred in a very dialogue-heavy adaptation of Ibsen's An Enemy of the People. After Bullet, McQueen was later considered for lead roles in other cop movies of the 70s like The French Connection and Dirty Harry, both of which the actor turned down since he didn't want to play another reactionary cop, and there was nothing those Boy Scouts down at Internal Affairs could do about it. Jacqueline Bissett appears as Bullet's girlfriend, Kathy. How can you be part of it without becoming more and more callous? Robert Vaughan seems to have wrapped up his stint as the hero of The Man from Uncle and switched gears to play Chalmers, who's not really a villain, just an authority figure that really has rubbed Bullet the wrong way. Get the hell out of here now. There are also many familiar character actors of the time, like Simon Oakland, Norman Fell, George Stanford Brown, and Robert Duval as a taxi driver. I thought I knew you, but I'm not so sure anymore. You have the amazing chase. But Bullet's lasting legacy is that so many action thrillers and television series from the next two decades were basically variations on Bullet in both its characters, its situations, and its style. Where? Dirty Harry, Starsky and Hutch, Hunter. The guy who plays by his own rules, gets chewed out by his bosses, has car chases down city streets, gets into shootouts in public spaces, who steals corpses for private autopsies. Okay, well, maybe not so much that last bit, unless I missed the time Starsky and Hutch went undercover as body snatchers. But you know what? There was nothing those quacks at the coroner's office could do about it. Lalo Schifrin provides a minimalist jazzy score. His theme for Bullet is memorable, especially when paired with the film's stylish opening titles. There are, however, huge swathes of the film with no musical accompaniment. The famous car chase and the sequence of Bullet and Ross chasing each other on the tarmac has no music, just sound effects. One of Bullet's, well, for lack of a better expression, Bullet points, was it was all about realism. The film was shot on location in San Francisco using the smaller, lighter Araflex cameras. Until the mid 60s, movies, particularly the ones shot in widescreen formats, usually required very large and bulky cameras. Cameras so heavy that if you asked the camera operator to go handheld, you'd probably end up with a very heavy camera dropped on your foot. By the mid-60s, smaller and lighter Araflex 35mm cameras had arrived on the scene. They allowed handheld shots and had been notable for their use in TV shows like The Man From U.N.C.L.E., which used the smaller cameras to shoot action scenes much, much faster. Bull is still mostly set up and framed much like any old-school movie. It hasn't suddenly embraced cinema verite-style shaky cam. There are very few shots that seem like they're done handheld. But with the smaller cameras, it was much easier to shoot the entire film purely in real apartments, offices, hospitals, and of course, cars. You could bolt the lighter Araflex onto the hood of a Mustang, where if you tried to do that with a giant heavy Mitchell camera, you'd possibly split the car in half if you slammed it into reverse. Two. Two what? Calls. He called twice. The second was long distance. How do you know it was long distance? It put in a lot of change. The film was produced by McQueen's own production company, Solar Productions. To direct British director, Peter Yates was hired. Yates had been a director of British film action series and his debut film, Robbery, proved to be a good calling card in Hollywood. Just as years later, his film, Krull, would not be a good calling card in Hollywood. Alas, that's despite what those pencil pushers in the commissioner's office would have you believe. Okay guys, back to work. 
San Francisco is not a city that's situated on a plain. The hilly topography made a great location for the beginning of the car chase scene. Which is why any time you have an action film set in San Francisco, you need to have a car chase through the streets, otherwise you're just wasting everybody's time. Bullet's powerful Mustang up against an even more powerful Dodge Charger saw stunt drivers having to work out a way that the villain's car wouldn't outrun Bullet's. That green Mustang became so beloved by car fans that Ford has occasionally made a green Bullet branded model of whatever its current Mustang was at the time. Funnily enough, Dodge kept quiet about their association with the film, perhaps for obvious reasons. The chase sequence took weeks to shoot and contributed towards the film's Academy Award for editing, among other awards garnered by the film at the time. I don't know about you, but perhaps more films should just stop and have people waiting to receive the facts. And maybe to develop the characters more, we could have heard a bit of their internal monologue. Yeah, did I, did I turn the gas off? I think I turned the gas off. I have a structured settlement and I need cash now. You sell whatever you want, but don't sell it here tonight. I personally rate Bullet a solid film. It was a very influential film for its time, a great film for its time, but it may seem relatively tame in hindsight, mainly because Frank Bullet shows little personality and motivation, so the film has to coast on Steve McQueen's charisma. I always like seeing San Francisco in movies, though here it's a San Francisco in 1968 without a trace of bikers or hippies or whatever. Any young people in this movie are all very well dressed with combed hair. Even Bullet's informant wears a suit and tie. And if those personal shoppers at Macy's don't like it, then they can have my badge and my gun. Except I don't have a badge or a gun, so instead they can have the next best thing, my label maker and my blockbuster video card. And of course, they'll have to pay any outstanding fees for me having hung on to the Blazing Saddles VHS for 20 years. That's where half of it is. You can't walk away from it. Frank Bullet wasn't as much of a grump as Dirty Harry, nor was his captain the shouty, angry man, and hardly anyone else took his lead and concealed fresh corpses for some odd reason. But it was a film that basically showed the makers of every other cop or detective thriller for the next 20 years just how to do it. It's bullshit. If you enjoyed this review, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, and there's nothing those ushers at the multiplex can do about it.